things. Um, I will, before I full screen and before we plunge into the principles of Postgrow, Phenomengard and New Media Art, I will uh, take the time to jingle some more, uh, to say thanks to the Rethinkable Festival, to the organizers, Mavi and the crew here. Um, yeah, Regione Autonoma Friuli Venezia Giulia, who is the main organizer, and a plethora of NGOs and universities from both sides of the border, uh, making sure that this cross-border festival of transformative economies and regional communities uh, took place, take, still takes place, but there is uh, the week of of adventures is coming to an end today and tomorrow with beautiful events also organized. Uh, um, there's a very interesting round table today in the afternoon organized by the uh, research uh, center of the Slovenian Academy of Arts and Sciences, whom we also have representatives here, Magdalena, and um, there's also independent researchers, which Andre would uh, probably represent, so not not to sound as if this is just uh, the School of Humanities of the University of Nova We have the, the Faculty of Social Sciences here. I think a beautiful cross-institutional, cross-sectoral, cross-border collaboration uh, taking place uh, as uh, you can see and being recorded. Uh, so much for me for the long introduction. Now let's hope this full screen works and we get on track. Just. Our today's presentation connects artworks and authors of the historical avant art from the early 20th century on the one side and today's new media and other social practices. Its main point is that in these cases of artworks, especially in those that we will discuss today, we can find concepts for thinking and living beyond the progress-driven society in which the desire for more is the guest of others. The motivation and artistic examples in its theoretical research is nowadays probably self-evident and does not require any additional explanation. Suffices that the ultimate climate crisis. The need for more, the need for faster, regardless of the context and consequences, is something that accompanies us every step of the way. And if we think about it, it is extremely difficult, completely counterintuitive, to imagine a value system through which we could evaluate and make sense of our everyday acts and gestures without it to be linked to some way of progress and accumulation, and that we would also feel good about it. So it would be connected only to loss and scarcity. And this is how we usually perceive something that is opposite progress. Anti-progress is bad, but that is why it is important to talk about a possibility of different perception, of different imaginary that can potentially expand also our experience that will go beyond progress and growth. And it's very interesting that we can find such conceptual and epistemological examples in something that is supposed to be very future-oriented already in its name, so the avant-garde. Indeed, we can already find concepts and methods of limit and release in the history of avant-garde movements, and moreover in today's new media and contemporary art practices that radically challenge these concepts, at least some of them, and can support a better understanding of art's social transformation ability based on the release of all kinds of power structures, such as economy, politics, language, nationality, gender, you name it. In the following, we will present the most productive examples that provide us with new ways of thinking outside the logic of continuous progress and growth. These cases indicate the value of notions which directly responded to the criticism of growth or which attacked the hierarchical structures that indeed serve as the supports of growth. We divided our presentation into five topics. Probably coming, coming up. Um, we divided our presentation in five topics uh, based on the artwork's characteristics that challenge our way of thinking and perceiving our everyday dynamics. This would be laziness, as shown by this machine, Laziness, disappearance, and non presence, as the first set. Universal language and cosmopolitanism, as the second set. 
different space-time conceptions, expanded sensorium trans and post-humanism, and last but not least, holistic and systemic view of the world. Let me go. So the urban plan is often perceived as a strong proponent of the utopian, utopian ideologies of progress and innovation. It is necessary to show that also the contrary is true. For example, for one of the most known avant-gardists, Kazimir Malevich, wrote more than 10, thousands of pages of theoretical text on objectlessness and objectless world, authenticity or the real can only come into being if we eradicate the striving for perfection and the idea of progress. To be without a project means to be without pressure from the outside structures. This means that almost anything can happen, possible and even the impossible. In his work, Malevich also proposed the aesthetics of non-work or laziness. Laziness is understood as crucial for any artistic and creative work. And moreover, it can be understood as a tactic for avoiding unmeaningful capitalist and alienated work. He explored this in 1922 in his text, Laziness as the Truth of Mankind. In his visual and spatial artistic work of suprematism, Malevich experiments with color and form movement and standstill darkness and whiteness. He shows the obscuration of visual objects and their disappearance into whiteness. The ideas of disappearance and non-presence in everyday life were artistically explored in the work by Dadaists and Surrealists, such as Walter Zerner, Marcel Duchamp. Important here is a very interesting, for example, data manifesto, yet also it is not very well known, um, named uh, and the title Last Loosening by Walter Sterner. This was written in 1920. Uh, or maybe data manifest from uh, Yugo Dadaist uh, Dragan Alexic from 1921, who introduces his own concept of as you likeness um, in Serbo Croatian. This was Kako te Dragos or Kako te Dragos in Slovenian. Uh, and this is this as you likeness can be understood as nothingness of Dada or indifference and the moment of coincidence um, that we know from the work of Tristan Zara. These especially Dadaist and suprematist work were not subordinated to the content or a goal, and this allowed it to question everything, showing inconsistencies of methodologies and progress-driven ideologies, and with that also revealing the invisible norms of society. And now for the new media right side of the slides. What if social media wasn't engineered to serve capitalism's need for growth? How might online collective communication be different if our time and attention were treated as the limited and precious resources that they are? Minus an experiment to ask these questions by artist Ben Grosser from 2021, a finite social network where users get only 100 posts for life. Rather than the algorithmic feeds visible like accounts, noisy notifications, and infinite scrolls employed by the platforms to induce endless user engagement, minus limits how much one posts to the feed and foregrounds. The second uh, case of uh, the same artist, uh, Ben Grosser's artistic work, is tokenized this from the same year, uh, last year. The central construct of the booming crypto art market is the creation of artificial scarcity. Through the tokenization of digital objects using NFTs, tokenized this generates countless digital artifacts that can only be viewed or accessed once. While this structure doesn't block someone from selling an NFT that points to a tokenized this page, it does ensure that the page it points to will never be seen by the purchaser of that NFT. So, most broadly, the work acts in opposition to the capitalist ideologies embedded in NFTs and the ways in which crypto art markets have already thrust an often anti-capitalist and anti-corporate art medium into a 21st century gold rush, get rich, quick kind of frenzy. And now for the domestic um, pastures, uh, Sasha Sedlacek of MoMA uh, presented at the Pixel Point Festival of 2019 here in the gallery next door. Um, borrowing its name from Ivan Goncharov's character, uh, Oblomov, the laziest character in the world's literature, I would argue, the Oblomov project is a non-work-for-work -work training platform. The project raises the question, can doing nothing be the ultimate form of labor in the age of automation? By employing the same technologies that uh, make uh, us actually work all the time, such as biometrics, the Oblomov platform turns laziness into a value. 
both ethically and economically, it democratizes one's privileged values and changes our perspective on laziness from something despicable into something worthy, thus turning laziness into a productive activity with purchasing power. In fact, you can work for the Obloma coins, and the Obloma coins, you can then uh, buy several things, uh, merchandise, of course, Obloma internal merch and so on. And you, can, you could buy also other things, but you just get and remain lazy. Cosmopolitanism and internationalism were one of the main characteristics of the European avant-garde. Moreover, we can even talk about this, uh, the orientation towards the cosmic and cosmic, especially in the early Russian and Ukrainian avant-garde, for example, futurism of Vladimir Hermikov and Alexei Kruchonik, as well as already mentioned suprematism of Marievich and Elisitsky. The avant-gardists were men and women of the future who transcended the national and were citizens of the whole world. Artur Pravan declared no single nationality and instead he claimed to be a citizen of 20 countries. Dadaism and nationalism can be seen as opposites. Dadaism cannot exist where there is nationalism. This universalist program of the avant-garde can be also tracked in the idea of one common language. That will be a new free language of poetic creation. This idea was initiated in 1912 in the theory and poetry of the futurists, such as Hryabnikov and Kruchonik, first through their illogical poetry and after as the notion of the star language or also transrational trans Zaum language, so kind of behind the mind Zaum. Similarly, in 1912, following the mandate of his manifesto, Marinetti developed his concept of parole e libertà, a free word poetry. This was a radical form of writing with collab in which futurists created works that could be interpreted both visually and verbally. Of course, all of these poetic experiments go beyond semantic meaning. These languages explore the idea of a technology and medium that will go beyond individual and will therefore present a new way of thinking and also relating. Quite similarly, on the new media side, there is a Another domestic Slovenian, well, Balkan, uh, representative uh, Vuk Čosic Dibaski, this uh, pioneer of uh, internet arts, also uh, decided to play with the ASCII standard set of uh, computer science, uh, which was done before. In 1966, they began realizing that standard sets of uh, computer uh, science basically. Um, yeah, punctuation signs, uh, digits, um, letters uh, could create images and even moving images. So this is deep ASCII, uh, suddenly maybe, uh, yeah, reminding of our deep throat and the cinema history, the interesting cinema history that could be uh, frivolously recoded into quite simplistic computer language. On a more complicated, complex and poetic side, um, Mez Breeze uh, created the Mezangel, an online language for code work and poetry, as she called it. In 1993, um, she began to develop this, this uh, kind of autonomous language. Um, her poetry then appeared across the internet over the last two decades under multiple names and connected to multiple avatars. Uh, Mezangel as a language uses programming uh, code and informal speech uh, to rearrange and dissect standard English, creating new and unexpected meanings. Meaning, as Breeze's approach to code work online experimental writing uh, that explores the relationship between machine and human languages is imbued with a sense of playfulness and creativity. These are just almost randomly picked examples, but to show the, the, the plethora of analogies between the historic avant garde and the current, we might call them neo or new neo avant garde, but in fact, just um, new technology, of course, technology critical or, well, you know, constructive, deconstructive practices this, that show at different kinds of possibilities um, that open up if we, in fact, question, criticize, but also master the technologies we develop before it happens, vice versa. So the avant-garde has undoubtedly also explored different Projects of space 
through their artistic experiments, visual formations, even conceptual. The works of the constructivist now Gabo, for example, shows his interest in modern physics and his work we find the influence of non-Euclidean geometry, Einstein's theory of relativity. Also, the Elisitsky's work is kind of understood as an artistic exploration of non-Euclidean space. Lisitsky, for example, referred to Hefman Minkowski and Einstein's theory of relativity in his work Ka und Pangeometry, so Kunst, Art and Pangeometry, would be English translation. So he explored, um, Lisitsky explored four dimensions of space and he plays his famous projections, prones, if he, as he called them, um, in the irrational space, connected with the concept also of the fourth dimension. In the historic avant garde, we find a whole bunch of examples of different ways of perceiving progress, not just as a usual progressive infinite linearity in time and space. This norm is challenged by new dynamics. Instead of dualism, we have polyphony. We encounter abstraction and non-mimetic art. Objects dematerialize, they flatten, they diffuse, even explode into fragments. Time is marked by Nietzsche's eternal return, by the spiral movement, or by eternal stillness and dynamism of Malevich's objectless world. We begin to think about the conditions needed for a different kind of life, a life that is marked by anti-horizon and inaction, different logics, different model, mode of living that does not mean non-living or death, but something completely different, something yet to be perceived and experienced. Now for the right side of the different space-time conceptions on the uh, new media roster. As you can see, I'm trying to pick uh, cases from both newest, kind of last three years, four years, and then the oldest, kind of the, the beginning of the media art uh, as we call it today. Although, of course, we could link media art or intermedia, multimedia artistic practices way back to, you know, the 20s or to Richard Wagner or to the old Greeks or Altamira, if you want. But we, 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 we had to, of course, uh, stop somewhere. Uh, and from the gaming, from the gaming realm, so gaming industry is controlled uh, by 505 games from 219 uh, is a very interesting um, sci-fi uh, sci gaming uh, uh, example, quite well selling. Um, nothing in this game will make sense when the game begins. And once you play through the full game and its expansions, you will learn that nothing really makes sense or at least not the kind of sense that our everyday lives have taught us to expect. There are rules, but until you visit a place where they aren't. So the set of rules that this game is playing along, you're not playing the game yourself, is completely outside the reach of the gamer itself. This is quite an unusual, quite a, quite a shifted uh, experience for, uh, for at least for any conventional uh, uh, gamer or gaming horizon of expectations, as we might say, okay? Um, these in, uh, the in-game objects and locations that seem to, uh, they seem to move through time and space at their own will, and they are a part of a certain setup of a nature, which again, remains completely out of grasp of the human, at least of the human player, the first person who is in the game, right? Um, from another set of uh, yeah, media arts practices, like a typical gallery installation of Brigitte Zic, uh, Mirror Space. It is an interactive network installation, one of the, one of the earlier examples uh, linked to the internet, which projects personal virtual mirror image onto the screen with the aid of the combination of the face of the visitor and data collected simultaneously from the internet. Okay. This image behaves like the physical presence of a real mirror image, but then it changes its position, dimensions, and features according to the movement of the viewer. The mirror image is active and alterable as long as the visitor remains in the data space of the installation. When the visitor departs, the image as her or his impression, so uh, Brigitte Zic, remains and continues to move together with other representations. The new man, the man of the future, was one of the main topics of the avant-garde. Although the avant-garde celebrated machine and machine aesthetics, the main way to achieve new human abilities was associated with new discoveries in science also, especially with the already mentioned research in physics. 
Even back then, so more than 100 years ago, the body was seen as obsolete. Even language was perceived as dead and petrified. One of the most interesting art projects was Mikhail Matyushin's project. He was a painter and composer, and he dealt with the topic of vision. In the 1920s, he developed a comprehensive theory termed the Zorbeck theory, which combines the sense of sight with knowledge. And he explored his ideas in his scientific and artistic experiments of broadened vision. Basically, he believed in the possibility of seeing other dimensions. So for him, the fourth dimension was an extremely important theoretical concept. The superhuman in avant-garde is enriched with a new technology, and at the same time, he also takes, or she, intuition as a key aspect. Osmos, uh, the cult's immersive, one of the first really completely immersive installations by Char Davis, um, is a very nice example of, uh, uh, yeah, complete immersion into a kind of a para quasi natural realm. You speak, you experience a tree, a tree like entity, and the um, environment reacts to the, to your breathing. So it was applying already quite quite complex uh, breathing uh, sensors. So you were breathing this this kind of environment, and the tree reacted towards you, um, which was quite a new experience. You might imagine in '95 for many people, and of course, uh, to power this uh, installation, they were like. Uh, there was a range of very non-eco, a range of big, you know, uh, server machines like workstation, PC computers uh, that had to run this in 95. However, in 2018, by the, we live in the ocean of air by, um, by the uh, group called Marshmallow Laser Feast. This has become by now a standard. This installation has traveled the world. The big cities, people put on their VR goggles, but they but they do plunge into a very nice and calm, but slightly eco-critical environment, showing that well, we are not alone as species, and that there is kin, there is other entities flowing around the air, swimming through the ocean that we might never experience in in visceral, in physical, in body terms, but of course, new. HD, super high density, almost realistic uh, depictions through the VR technology uh, make it possible to be uh, experienced. On the other side, on the on the on the post-humanist side, but also the expanded sensorium, I found this very early examples of uh, Staus Tensley, the, the, the uh, yeah, uh, probably the father, the grandfather of uh, his work called Cyber SM, Sato Mazo. So it's kind of a Kind of a speculative, but also very functional telematic, uh, potentially sadomasochistic application where you can stimulate the other person who might be of a very different or a fluid gender who might have an avatar that they themselves are chose, which is uh, which is uh, which was quite early in the uh, in the um, in the uh, history of uh, now. Of course, uh, interrelational uh, It was again quite physically to be um, to be experienced and backed by a very sound media theory of uh, Stahl's ethic, who's still around, uh, such as uh, Stellark, uh, of course, the cult uh, body artist uh, working a lot around the expanded body, uh, working with robots swallowing or at least trying to swallow uh, robots and putting a third R on a third ear on his forearm. Okay, and, and an ear that, that slightly, that was already hearing things or could record MP3 and could uh, then later on even produce, or he had the idea to have something in his teeth that could reproduce sound and virtually he did very early in the 90s and he was around in Slovenia a lot. So I chose this case and right now we had a, um, an archival exhibition in Maribor of his work. Um, tried and experimented around a, a lot of these things. Uh, there's also a very interesting article um, publications about his work, so check it out on this topic. Last but not least, holistic and systemic views of the world. Oh yeah, in fifth case uh, of the fifth topic, uh, holistic and systemic view of the world. Avant-garde artist and architect Vladimir Putin is focusing on experimenting with new materials and redesigning everyday objects with the goal to ultimately influence the whole society. 
He's mostly known for his unfunctional designs of the flying apparatus Letatlin and the monument to the Third International, and for his redesigns of everyday objects such as teapots, working clothes, and other goods that were never mass produced. His work is characterized by concepts of organicism, craft, and humanized technology. Tatlin was producing for the future with the means of modern technology, but he always stayed connected with nature in the past. He sought to put objects in dialogue with their surroundings. He wanted to make them part of the living whole and to give them a dialogical character. These characteristics of interconnectedness, openness, and dialogue between objects represent the base of the principle of organicism, which is a starting point of Tatlin's work. Another very original example is the work circle of the Hungarian avant-garde group around Lajos Kasek, so-called Munka Corps, consisting of artists, students, and young workers, which had a significant effect on the workers' movement of the late 20s and 30s. These work circles can be very productive in redefining sustainability and along the double-sided concept of usefulness and uselessness, and even to problematize the precarious freelance work today, calling for possibilities of systemic solidarity and mutual support. Even more, avant-garde work circles of Lajos Kashak show the importance for mapping skills and activities, as well as connected resources as tools and materials that can be useful in times of ecological crisis, but might be considered useless in today's information society. Well, in yours, the new extractivism extracts the gist and all of the main problems of the current platform capitalist extractivist strategies and trying to get our data and our intimacy, as you know, and sell it to the others or use it for their own further growth. This beautiful blueprint of a machine-like superstructure, an assemblage of concepts and allegories, as Vladan calls it, is a beautiful short animation and a set of uh, visuals and posters that well explain uh, the mechanisms behind and might uh, hint at some relatively optimistic uh, future uh, scenarios or at least get away uh, people if you want uh, for the uh, otherwise gloomy future uh, being all um, entrapped into platform uh, technologies as you can see we are. Uh, Disnovation.org, uh, very explicitly post-growth, okay, post-growth prototypes uh, that invite us to question dominant narratives of growth and progress and to explore speculative environmental accounting models of the limits of the quantifiable. Post-growth prototypes is a series of critical case studies which puts provocative academic models to work. It addresses biosphere work, solar income, and energy transition in the Anthropocene. Over nine chapters, uh, this innovation of work attempts to highlight through the necessary, uh, necessarily distorting lens of scientific models, some of the facets of our contemporary environmental condition, which are often obscured, unquantifiable, imperceptible, entangled complex complexities and the known unknowns. Uh, so yes, uh, the artistic uh, talents and the uh, media or transmedia formats and expressions can be used for both a better understanding and a better uh, suggesting of the alternatives, which is the post-growth toolkit. This is what it does. Uh, it questions uh, what ideological, social, and biophysical factors have precipitated the current environmental crisis? What leverage is available for transformative practices and imaginaries to overcome the continuous growth of our energy consumption. So this toolkit re-envisions social metabolism through an understanding of the energy it requires, reconnecting human survival with the living material qualities of the biosphere, drawing on eco-feminism, indigenous knowledge, environmental accounting, and historical materialism. This is some of the references. They, some of the artworks might be hard to find, but we are already in the uh, closing chapter of our oops. In, uh, with, uh, yeah, should we go to close or we can just have it there and uh, yeah, let's go to the conclusion because we still have two presentations. So hopefully with these comparisons, you have developed a sense of how many different and time with artistic procedures the avant-garde invented in order to influence the perception and understanding. In this way, we can conceive the avant-garde not only as an 
an art project, but also an epistemological project. This also shatters notions of the avant-garde as an aesthetic formal monolith that is excessive or productive only in its social ambitions, that is, in its social demands, utopias. But in fact, the avant-garde proves to be the most subversive in its micro-project, such as expanded vision, the use of language in a new poetic way to search for relationships between perception and form, and not the least the questioning of some basic ethical notions. Uh, so in the concluding part, we wanted to uh, present a couple of contemporary theoreticians who offer additional arguments uh, for these perspectives on the connection of avant-garde and new media contemporary art uh, and how they kind of think uh, about these uh, artistic practices in this uh, way about a power release um, and limit. Uh, so we included uh, Christoph Jarek's book, The Force of Art, uh, which is a very interesting book Then the John Roberts the book Revolutionary Pathos, Negation, and the Suspensive Avant-Garde. It's an article in the book, The Idea of the Avant-Garde and What It Means Today. And then uh, the Mark James Leger, The Idea of the Avant-Garde, again, the same book. Uh, and Mishko Shvakovic, uh, I think the last book, um, Aesthetica Epistemologia Etica Speculativni Hindere Media, uh, that was published in 2020. Um, I think that's it, then yeah. we shouldn't go into no. theory. So you see we'll two beautiful quotes. There will be a nice article with more smart conclusions on theoretical level. We hope that this rather um, case-based uh, comparison was enough inspiring to all. Thank you very much.